Hey everybody, this is Callan Thomas coming to you with episode two of Right Off the Bat, the podcast named for this New York Times best-selling book by Jim Darby. <laughs> I wish, I wish. Hello everybody, and Callan, it's great being with you again, and our guest today is arguably the greatest player ever to play the game of baseball, Pete Rose. Pete, thanks for joining us. Hey, Dark. It's good to see you. It's been a long time. We had a lot of uh, good times back in the 70s and 80s, and uh, we introduced the, the United States to uh, Mizuno at the time. You know, I, I used all their gloves. I used all their batting gloves. I used the shoes. I used the bat. Broke all the records with Mizuno bats, and uh, it, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, th those were the days when Easton and Mizuno were together. So there was about a 12-year period where the companies were joined, and then they, of course, separated in the 90s. And now, can you believe it's 2020? Man, where have the years gone? They went by fast, no question about it. <clears throat> However, uh, even though the years are going fast, no one's approaching my record. <laughs> Nobody ever will. So, so Pete, let, let's, let me take that opportunity. Um, and let me just say, I'm, I'm absolutely giddy today to be able to talk to you. I, I, we've met a couple times in the past. I know you go way back with Darbs, but you just mentioned your records and I just want to give all the listeners out there, believe it or not, Pete, people actually tune in and listen to Darbs and I, I still can't believe it, but <laughs> you just mentioned your records. Just, I was doing some research yesterday. I mean, I know how great of a player you are. And, and I'll tell you this, the very first baseball game my dad ever took me to in, in 1984, the Reds were set to play a double header at Candlestick Park against the Giants. And you were the player manager at the time. Right. They probably don't remember, just a throwaway game. But the first game of the double header went extra innings and it ended up going 18 innings. <laughs> so the first game was equivalent to a double header and my dad and I rode the whole thing out and, and, uh, it was awesome. So the very first major league baseball game I ever went to, uh, I got to see you play, but just uh, so, so all the listeners know, okay, obviously you're the hit King, most hit hits in baseball history, 4,256. You've played more games than any other baseball player in the history of the game. You've got three World Series titles, three batting titles, a National League MVP, a National League Rookie of the Year, two gold gloves, 17-time All-Star, and a member of Major League Baseball's All-Century team. So when you just say, yeah, I have a few records, I mean, come on, Pete, this is, this is unbelievable. And, and uh, for, for a guy like me, I'm a, I'm a little younger than you guys, but, um, this is, this is, uh, I gotta say like a, a dream come true to be talking to you this morning. So, so thanks so much for joining us. Well, I appreciate you, uh, saying those good things about me, but, uh, the best record I have, the way I look at it, the way I played and the way I thought about playing is I played in 1972 winning games. That's, uh, <clears throat> 250 more than the guy that's second. And I think that's Carl Yaskrimski because I was very fortunate to always be on good teams with good players. I played with 11 Hall of Fame players and I played against Mays, Aaron, Clemente, Musewell. I mean, all those great players. And the only thing that could be better for me is if I'd have had the opportunity to play, for, uh, play with Babe Ruth or, or Lou Gehrig or Ty Cobb. But that's the kind of guys I got to play with. And, <clears throat> and I played actually with those guys in a lot of all-star games because we were in the same league. I mean, if you ask Willie what's the best league, he'll tell you National League. You ask Al Kaline what's the best league, he would have told you American League because we played our whole careers in the National or American League. The only one that didn't was Frank Robinson. I played with Frank 63, 64, and 65. Then all of a sudden, the Red study was too, too old. They traded him to Baltimore. And in 66, he wins the Triple Crown. That's how <laughs> old he was. But he, got, he got but he got traded for a pretty good pitcher in Milt Pappas. Milt Pappas. Yeah, we got Jack Balsham, a relief pitcher, and a young outfielder named Dick Simpson. Okay? But, but Darbs, you know, Milt Pappas is always like this, right? And what was this? Fifth inning, after the fifth inning was over, he pitched like this. He'd be looking for the bullpen, <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 like pitchers, like pitchers today. Give me, I gave you a five and fly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Wait, which is which is how most pitchers are today. Yeah, yeah. They're not expected to you know, go. You know, do you know, Callan, you, you listed off all those records that Pete has, which is amazing. I looked at the – you walked – I think I wrote it down here. 1,000 – God, how many times? How many bases on balls? Just a yeah, ton. Over 1,500. But, over 1,500. Yeah, but you, do you realize if you add that up 90 feet, that's over 26 miles of walks? You ran a marathon in walks. But he always sprinted to first base after he yeah. walked. So don't say he walked a marathon. Yeah. He sprinted it. Yeah. The good thing about walks, okay <clears> – <throat> I mean, to be honest with you guys, and this guy's the first ballot Hall of Famer, but that's the difference in me and Ishiro. Ishiro only has like 400 walks, but he's got 3,000 hits. I got 4,000 hits and 1,500 walks. You know, I actually got on base. I'm a leadoff hitter, right? I got on base over 5,900 times. I remember when Joe Morgan, God rest him, we lost Joe a couple weeks ago. And he came over from Houston to Cincinnati. And I was kidding him one day, and I said, Joe, let me ask you a question. Do you like to hit when the pitcher's in the stretch? He said, hell yeah, everybody does. I said, well, you see that door over there with Sparky's office? I said, you go in there and you tell Sparky you want to hit after me. <laughs> 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 because the guy's going to be in the stretch more often than he's not. And, of course, Joe was a back-to-back -back MVP, and, Maybe, if not, uh, the greatest second baseman ever, certainly one of the top two. And I got to play with the greatest third baseman ever, Mike Schmidt. I got to play with the greatest catcher ever, Johnny Bench. Uh, Tom Seaver was a pretty good pitcher. I got to play with him. Uh, Carl, Steve Carlton was a pretty good pitcher. I got to <laughs> listen to this, Tim. Jim, this is interesting. <clears throat> I was thinking about this about a month ago, okay? I'm going to give you a list of guys I played with. These were my teammates, if you can believe it. Catcher Bench, third base Schmidt, shortstop Larkin, second base Morgan, first base Perez, left field Robinson, center field Reigns, right field Dawson, left-hand pitcher Carlton, and right-hand pitcher Tom Seaver and manager Sparky Anderson. Every position on the field, every position on the field, I played with a Hall of Famer. I don't think anybody else can say that. And Pete, and Pete, you you left yourself out there. What position are you playing on that team? I didn't make the team. I'm the oh, okay. player. <laughs> Give me a break. Give me a break. <laughs> here's here's the amazing thing, though. I've got this book here. I was showing Callum before we started today. This book, Sports. Do you have this? Yeah. Sports Illustrated put this out about five years ago, and they listed the top ten in their opinion of uh, in each position in the history of the game the only guy who is in the top 10 in two different positions is pete rose they've got him that's number seven third baseman and the number i think four right fielder and what's amazing at first base he's they list him as the 12th best ever you're listed in three different positions best ever in those, I mean, think about that for a minute. And also, you played the All Star Game at five different positions. I mean, dude, think about it. Come on, who now, does that? Now, don't turn this into an R rated show and ask, <laughs> me, and ask me my favorite position. Okay? Oh no, we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because if you do, I'm the only one in the room that's going to say first base. <laughs> was that was that your favorite first? Oh, base? it was fun, Jim. I wish I had played first base my whole career because, oh. you know, you're holding runners on. You got bunt coverage. You're the cutoff man from center and right field. And there's more conversation at first base because there's a hell of a lot more singles than there are uh, doubles or triples or home runs. And I was a real talking to players to all the guys I was playing against. So, you know, first base, uh, I got to play there when I went to Philadelphia. I changed and went from third to first. Uh, and then when I went back as player manager of the Reds, I played first base. So I had six or seven years at first base. And uh, you know what? To be honest with you guys, I don't think I ever got my just due for the way I played first base. I worked my ass off. You know, when I went to Philadelphia, we went to spring training in Clearwater. We used to have a guy that uh, was an instructor named Ron Plaza. You, remember, you ever met sure, him? Sure, I remember Ron. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And for the first two weeks I was in spring training, him and I would go down to the complex and just work like two hours in a row on playing first base, short hops, 
footwork in, out, up, down. So I really put my work in before I even went up to start taking BP in spring training and playing in the games. And that's what I had to do. I didn't have to do that at third base because I remember it's, uh, it's Gary Nolan's first day back off the disabled list. And Sparky called me in the office, it was 75. And he said, listen, he said, we got to get more offense. I'm, I'm leading the league in hitting, playing left field. Okay. I said, Sparky, what the hell you want me to do? He said, I want you to move to third base. And this is a Monday. And I said, well, when you want me to move? He said, Thursday. <laughs> so the first thing I had to do moving from left field to third base is go buy a jock strap. I didn't wear a jock strap. <laughs> yeah, you know, jock strap. Yeah. You know, the third base, hey, what are you going to be talking like this real quick? <laughs> and then I went in, and it was May 5th of 75. I went to third base. Falster went to left field. Uh, he was sitting on the bench. And we won two straight world championships, 75 and 76. And George, in 77, hit 52 home runs. So, George was the added offense that we needed in the lineup. Hey, Pete, the, the, this is just awesome. I could just sit here all day and listen to you. I, I did want to take the conversation in a little different way just because of uh, of your great baseball mind. And, and, you know, World Series just wraps up last week. The Dodgers, uh, you know, and their 32-year drought. And it was a crazy season, though, you know, just the 60 games and then the expanded playoffs and, and the sprint to it. Um just wanted to check in with you on on your on your thoughts of this this past season and and just beyond that you know the current state of the game the game's probably different than when you played it's more focused on the home runs and there's a lot of strikeouts and you, you didn't do that and then you got all these analytics versus just watching a guy play um, can you just kind of walk us through your your feelings if you if you watch the World Series we just went through first of all, I'm happy that they got to play the World Series. And it, it ended up okay because you had the two best teams in there. You had the best team in the American League, the best team in the National League, okay? But that was a horribly played World Series. And I think what screwed the World Series up, and by the way, it was the lowest rated World Series ever, okay? Nine million, my, nine million people watched the World Series. I read that about three days ago. So that's, first of all, that's not good for baseball. But, uh, there were so many pitchers on both staffs that both managers overmanaged. We had a different pitcher in there every inning. You, you saw it, I saw it. And they didn't know how, because of no off days, they didn't know how to use their pitching staffs. But they each had 14 people on their pitching staffs, and they seemed like they used them all the time. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? So uh, with no off days, you manage the, the, the game differently, especially you manage your pitching staff differently. And that one game when, when uh, Tampa Bay won with the two errors in the, in the last inning, I mean, that was ridiculously played baseball. And we, we saw a lot of mental mistakes. This analytics, I mean, uh, you know what I wish baseball would do? I don't know how you guys feel about this. I don't know if they could do it. They had to eliminate the shift, okay, make the game more interesting. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, you can, only, you can only have two fielders on the right side or two fielders on the left side. Because guys are hitting line drives that went over the second baseman's head, and guys are playing short right field. They get it on one hop, throw the guy out. I know one thing. I wish they'd have shifted on me when I played. Okay? I know another thing. You can't win a batting title today with the shift. If you're, if you're a pull hitter, you cannot win the batting title. And – Hey, singles count, doubles count, triples count. You know, like, like the, Red, the Reds this year, they were in the playoffs. They got shut out in the, the first. They didn't score in the playoffs. They didn't, did not score 23 innings. But they had more walks this year than singles. How do you have more walks than singles and make the playoffs? Well, you know what, I, what, 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 what drives me? What drives me crazy is I thought about you while on these shifts, and I said, okay, what's the worst thing for a pitcher? In my mind, is the leadoff guy getting on base. Yeah. If yeah. the leadoff guy in an inning gets on base, now you're pitching defensively, okay? If you get that first guy out, okay, a lot of pressure off. So I see that they put a shift on some left-handed hitter to lead off an inning. The whole left side is open. I'm thinking, my God, just butt it. 
get on first base. Well, well first of all, Darb, I, I don't think, uh, as a manager, I, I don't think there's that many pitchers today, and there's some really good ones out there, by the way. I don't think the majority of pitchers pitching today can throw the ball where they want to. And if you've got the shift on, you have to throw it into the shift. Okay? you got to shift uh, to right field. You can't throw balls away because guys are hit it to left field. If you've got to shift to left field, you can't throw the ball away or you hit the right field. So I just don't have that much confidence. And another thing that, that these pitching changes do, Jim, is I think you'll agree that baseball's problem, one of their problems, are the, the length, of, the time of the games. Like, I, you remember a couple, three weeks ago, there was a team won a game, they shut the other team out, and they used nine pitchers? Remember that? Just three weeks ago, four weeks oh, you ago. See, you, you see that all the time. I mean, the, how can you speed up the game if you're bringing a new pitcher in every inning from the bullpen? Well, they tried that new rule. They have to go at least three batters. At least that's a start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, then what you're doing is you're tying the hands of the manager. Because what happened to, I got a great left-hand hitter up there. I want to bring my best left-hander in to face him. And the next guy's right-handed. I want to bring my best right-hander in to face him. That, that's that, – that strategy is out the window. I mean, I don't know where baseball uh, made these rules. You can't break up a double play. You can't run into a catcher. You can't pitch inside. I mean, listen, if you slide into a second baseman the wrong way, players know how to police the area, okay? It's just like uh, we didn't have a lot of headhunters back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. A headhunter – is someone that throws at a guy's head. You know why we didn't in the National League? Because the pitcher had to hit. He had to hit. Yeah. American League didn't have to hit. All you got to worry about is a guy charging the mound. Okay? Gibson, all the great pitchers that I'll talk about, Drysdale, Gibson, Marischal, they all pitched inside, but they didn't hit you. Okay? You pitch inside, you move the guy this far off the plate, that gives you that much far of the plate on the outside. You don't want to hit. Oh, the only guy you hit is the guy you can't get out. <laughs> That's the only guy you hit. If, if I'm if I'm ten for fifteen off of a guy, I don't want him to hit me. He probably wants to hit me, but I don't want to because I'm going to get a hit off the the guy. I have a track record with him. Hey Pete, uh, you brought something up, and and we're talking about the shift, and and you brought up Ichiro earlier, and I'm just thinking back to when I'm a kid, and and you, and guys like Rod Carew, and and. Boggs and and Gwynn, guys that I felt would use the whole field and and you know wear out different areas of the field. Uh, you know they pitch. You mentioned it. The pitchers pitch and whether they pitch into the shift or not, everybody wants to be pull happy. Who are the hitters today that you see kind of in that light, or 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 how do you just view hitters today like what are they trying to do what what's what's the goal now with the offense cuz there's not as much pressure on the defense i feel like let, let me tell you what the owners of baseball uh it, it partly ruined the game and i'll tell you why because they have they have convinced the players that if you hit 25 to 35 home runs you're going to make 15 million a year they don't give a damn if you strike out 200 times they don't care if you strike out 180 times Give me 30 home runs, okay? They don't care about 100 RBIs, okay? Probably, you guys may disagree with this, but I think right now the best player in baseball, probably Mookie Betts. He hits the ball to all fields, okay? He hits the ball to right field, left field, and center field. You know, he is close to 300. He, he's a small guy. He still hits home runs. You know, Trout's a good player, no question about that. The only problem <coughs> I have with Mike Trout is uh, – Great players, Mays, Aaron, Clemente, all those type of guys, they eventually get their team in the World Series. They lead their team to the promised land. Trout has not been able to do that, even though he's really, really been the best player the last seven, eight, nine years. You, you agree with that? I mean, yeah. if yeah. you're the best player, you've got to get your team somehow over the hump. Okay? And, you know, I play with a lot of great players who, who got their, their teams over the hump. Schmidt got his team over the hump. Bench Morgan got their team over the hump. Mays got his team over. Aaron got his team over. Yaskrimski got his team over. They, 
I mean, the superstars of the game eventually worry so much about the team that they concentrate every day. How can I make the team better? You know, because there's no question in my mind that Trout makes everybody around him better. Okay? If you're, if you're Mike Trout, hey, I, I want to hit in front of him. I want to hit after him. I just want to do a lot of things because he's the best player. Mookie Betts, he's right in the middle of that good lineup. they got a good lineup. The Dodgers got a really good lineup. That's why they, they won so many games this year. But the lineup, when you got Peterson and, and Bellinger and Muncie and people like that, they're all thinking long ball. They're all thinking long ball. And I don't know if I can manage today, Jim, because I'm – I, I, I wasn't a short ball manager, but every once in a while, especially in these extra inning games, you got a guy on second to start the inning, get that guy over to third with one out. It puts all the pressure in the world on the defense. I mean, but I think we saw one or two, I think we saw one or two sacrifice bunts in all the playoffs this year, not just the World Series, the whole line of playoffs, two sacrifice bunts. Well, you know, it's funny watching, watching the guys try to bunt it's They don't know how to do it. They don't because they don't work on it because nobody wants a bunt, Jim. If you got a guy on second, I'm up there. I want two RBIs. I don't want one, even though one will win the game. Okay. I want two RBIs. Okay. Can I tell you a funny story? One time, am I allowed to curse? Uh, uh, to, to a point. <laughs> All right. We're, we're playing Joe Nuxall. Remember Joe? Sure. He was our announcer, and he had a post-game show. And he did it right from the dugout, okay? And I love Tony Perez. I've been knowing him since 1960, okay? That's how far back he, we were at Geneva in the New York Penn League in 1960. And Tony hit a home run one night, and Joe's right next to the dugout doing the post-game show. And Tony hits a home run in the bottom of the ninth. We win the game. He's coming around third base. He's going right to Joe's post-game show and Joe says Tony he says congratulations he said what did you hit and Tony looked up at him you know Tony's got the, the English problem he said Joe he said I hit a cockeye fastball <laughs> oh man <laughs> Joe started yeah. laughing so hard he had to go to a commercial <laughs> We're all, there, we're all sitting there listening to Tony. Oh, he didn't know he did anything wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Baseball been very, very good to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story that, that still blows my mind about the, how they look at the game today. Yeah. The Giants were playing a game a couple years ago, yeah. and they're down two runs going to the bottom of the ninth here in San Francisco, and Brandon Belt is leading off the bottom of the ninth. So – I'm thinking, okay, you're down two runs. You got to get on. Your run means nothing unless somebody. All right, so he so he comes up to the plate and they put a shift on, and I'm thinking, you got to be kidding. Why would you? you... I'm thinking the leadoff guy. And I mean, there was nobody on the left side. Literally nobody. The shortstop was almost over by second base. Belt just put the ball down. You you're the tying run. Then comes to the plate, right? What does he do? He swings at the first pitch, hits a shot. I mean, a screamer right into the shift, caught for out number one. And I'm going, I don't get it. I don't get it. You know, that's the game today. I mean, even in that situation, I'm not against a guy laying a bunt down. No, that's what I mean. I want to get the tie and run to the dish. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And here's another thing about my career, and uh, I, I got probably got to take my hat off to you, because uh, Candlestick Park was the worst. I don't know how... I don't know how Mays and McCovey played their whole career at Candlestick Park. It was a beautiful city. I mean, San Francisco is a beautiful city. We all know that. But that ballpark, I mean, it was so cold. It was so windy. Uh, our dugout was down on, on the third base side, their dugout. And our clubhouse, as you know, was all the way down the right field line. So consequently, there's no going to the clubhouse during the game. Okay? It's just too, just too damn far to go. and. Marichelle would actually, you know, he would wait. You know, he, he wouldn't throw to you like you're up to bat. And if you're, you're, you're in there so long, your, your eyes start watering. And every time your eyes are water, that's how Mitch would throw the ball. I mean, this, this guy was, 
I mean, I hit 340 off of Juan Marichal. But I think he was one of the, if not the best pitcher I ever faced. I couldn't hit Koufax. I got 10 for 57 off Koufax. Believe it or not, I couldn't hit Randy uh, Jones. I got one for you. I, you won't ever believe. We were beating the Giants one night. I don't know what the hell the score was, 18 to 2 or something like that. And they brought Kingman in the pitch. Oh, yeah. Well, he was a good pitcher in college. Kingman struck me out. <laughs> he got me two strikes and threw one of them damn blooper pitches, and it was over my head, and the umpire called it strike three. <laughs> so I don't I'm doubt that. King. I'm the hit king, and Dave Kingman struck me out. <laughs> hey, all right. This is, you want to talk about today's game with analytics. I'm going to tell you guys a story. Pete, you'll remember this. You know, they, they rely on the computers to tell them things these days, right? I remember sitting in your office on the night of September 11th, 1985, okay? The night you broke Ty Cobb's record. And two or three hours before the game, I'm in your office with you, and we're just shooting the breeze, right? And I started asking you about how did you do off this guy? How did you do off that guy? Like you were just talking about. Unbelievable. I'm not, I'm not lying when I tell you this. You named off, and I must have asked you, 50 pitchers, how'd you do against that guy? You knew every one of them without having to look it up. Every single one of them. Well, when we go on a two-week road tri uh, trip, Jim, I knew every pitcher I was going to face uh, for the next two weeks. And that was my business. Okay, I didn't have a book where I wrote down Eric Shaw. I mean, I knew I was going to uh, – Eric Shaw was the type of guy, if you're going to look for a record, he was probably the guy you wanted pitching because – he, was, he had good stuff, but he was around the plate. He'd always you got, get, your, you got your big knock off of Eric Shaw. The, yeah, the, the he record, would give you yeah. a pitch to hit. And j I just knew that, that that night when I took batting practice, I was going to get a hit first time up because I had a great batting practice. Just everything I hit was on the right on the button. And then Eric Shaw is the guy that's going to put the ball in play, and I happened to hit the ball to left field. I mean, if you want to know the truth, I, I probably got 2,500 hits right past the pitcher up the middle. Okay. So if they were shifting on me today, I don't know if I'd have got 4,000 hits because I hit so many balls right back up the middle. That's the biggest hole in a baseball field. When I played because a shortstop, maybe playing a little bit to pull second base is playing in the pool. So up the middle is wide open. And that's where I would try to hit the ball. If it's inside, you pull it. If it's outside, you hit the ball to left field. And I tell don't, people, but but don't you think you would have adapted if they'd done yeah, the shift? Absolutely. Because I I understood at an early age, Jim, what I could do and what I couldn't do. And I and I understood at an early age I wasn't going to be a home run hitter. My job was to get hits, play defense, get on base, and score runs. That was my job. And that's what I went out and did. Bench knew what his job was. Morgan knew what his job was. Davey knew what his job was. You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we had the best team in the history of baseball. I'm talking about the big red machine. But I will argue until I die that we had the most entertaining team ever. We had batting champions. We had home run champions. We had RBI champions. We had a golden glove catcher, second base shortstop, center fielder. We had a flamboyant manager, a Hall of Fame. You know, we, we just had everything – that you needed to entertain the fans. There's not too many teams today have that, those ingredients, if you understand what I'm saying. We, and here's another thing. We're the only team in the history of baseball with a black superstar, Hall of Famer, Joe Morgan, Latino, Tony Perez, white, Johnny Bench, Sparky, Hall of Fame managers. Now, someday, if Roger Clemens makes it, the Yankees can say that because they got Jeter, they got Rivera, they got Torrey, they need the white guy. And if that would be Clemens, then they'd have that ingredient. But we're the only team to date that has that ingredient. That's what made us such a good team. And we all, we all knew what our job was. I didn't try to do Joe's job. He didn't try to do Johnny's job. You know, Tony Perez knocked in almost 1,700 runs, hitting after Johnny Bench. Johnny didn't leave that many ducks on the pond. That's how good Tony Perez was. Yeah, that's interesting. If I, if I need an RBI and I got a guy on second or third, okay, I want Tony Perez at the bat, okay? 
I don't want Willie Mays. I don't want Hank Aaron. I, I'd love to have him, but I had Tony Perez. He just got dollar signs in his eyes when it was a man in scoring position. He was unbelievable. He was unbelievable. I knew him since 1960. I'm two days out of high school. He's two months out of Cuba. When I got to Geneva, New York to play for the Geneva Reds in the New York Penn League, he was the Saloon Abasi on that team. They moved him to third and put me at second. That's how far back Tony Perez and I go. That's, that's how many years is that? 60? 60 years. years. I've been known Tony Perez 60 years, and he still can't speak English. <laughs> I ate with, with him about a month ago in Cincinnati. We went to lunch. Darbs. I sat there for two freaking hours, and I didn't understand a word he said. <laughs> so things haven't changed. Go ahead, Cal. Hey, I, I want to switch it up. I think, Pete, one of the great things about listening to you right now is just um, everybody knows you're the hit, hit king. But just to hear your baseball. I'm the out king, too. I, I, well, hey, hey baseball is a game of failure. But um, you, you succeeded pretty well. But just to hear you talk about putting in the work, uh, putting in the work, knowing the pitchers who you're going to face, uh, working on the on the craft and and just knowing all the other players in the league it's just what a well-rounded player you you were and and what it took to win so i want to i want to bring up darbs's book here right off the bat and if you remember this you and i crossed paths a couple years ago in las vegas and i told you about this book and um your response to this was there's no way jim darby wrote that book he doesn't know how to read or write (laughs) pete knew me too well (laughs) but i said in this book, Pete, on page 177, we're talking about what a great player you were. Jim Darby, and I quote, called you the greatest marketer um, a baseball player could be as well. And there's just this fantastic story in this book. Uh, Darbs had traveled with you guys for two weeks. This is how different the world was back then. Now, if, if there's something to say or post in the media you put it on social media on instagram it's there right there darbs traveled with you guys for two wet weeks preparing for you guys and preparing for you to break the record so he could get a, a picture of it and put it on the newspaper i mean that's how old that that stuff is but darbs tells this story about how how president reagan called you that night and you said no 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 mr president hold on i gotta well he, well, he was doing a pete was doing a press conference and the equipment guy yelled out hey you have a phone call from the president so callan go ahead from there yeah and then darb says you know i can't believe it pete rose is telling the leader of the free world to, to hold on and take his call but then darb says you went and put on a brand new pair of darb's batter's gloves because you knew that they would snap a picture with you holding the phone and you were going to get Darbs that press that he needed. And just, you are talking about what a great hitter you were and whatever. But it, you also understand the business of baseball. And we need fans. We need entertainment. And I just, I, I, re-read, I reread Darbs' book last night. And, and believe it or not, Pete, Darbs can, can write a little bit. I mean, you might deny that. <laughs> I mean, he was always around. And he always understood the players. And all the players liked him. Not because... Every time you saw him, he was giving somebody a glove. <laughs> he, he was always, that helped. He was always giving stuff away every time you come around. Said, oh, hey, Darb's here, man. We're, we're going to get some Easter. We're going to get some Mizuno. And he'd have a big, he like Santa Claus without the beard. And he always <laughs> the players, and all the players loved Jim Darby. I mean, they, they just, because uh, it, was, it was glove time when he came around. And I, I remember, uh, you used to have the, Remember the truck you guys had? Oh, the motorhome. Yeah, sure. Motorhome. And I sat there one day and watched the guy make me a glove. Yeah. He made me a third baseman glove. He made it to me with me watching. Yeah. Was Yo- Yo- Yoshi Sabota. Yoshi. Yeah, that was Yoshi. Man, that guy knew how to make gloves. Yeah. And, you know, I, I hate to tell you, but uh, when I was playing, Easton and Mizuno had the best equipment. I'm not saying it because it was free. I mean, I used the same first baseman glove my whole career. I use a, I had the same bat, the same Mizuno bat I used in a 44 game hidden streak. Guys today can't use a bat two at bats. They break it. They break but you know, Pete, what Callan was saying is interesting, and I, I'm glad Callan brought it up because, you know, you, yeah, I mean, so many, many great ball players over the years, okay? But you have always 
epitomized the game of baseball to me. Obviously, the hustle and the ability to play so many positions. But the way you market the game to people, the way you present the game. And you did that in our business relationship. You always made sure the product showed. You went out of your way. I remember when you broke Cobb's record and you had the press conference. And you told me, hey, before we start the press conference, get me the jacket and I'll put it on up on the on the podium. You remember that? Yeah. I mean, how many ball players think of that? So you you epitomize the game not just as a player, but as baseball, as the business, the game as an itself. ambassador. What's your ambassador? Talking, what he's talking about? Absolutely right. Because when I'm in the press conference, I had my Mizuno red jacket on. Okay, and someone asked me, "How did you get all those hits?" I remember I took the jacket and I opened it up, and I had a Wheaties shirt on. <laughs> I, I did the Wheaties commercial, yeah. and I yeah. went like this. I said, "That's how I did it." But Jim, you know, I mean. I don't get you. I don't think you ever get tired of it, but uh, people always pat me on the back for the way I played. And, and, and I like to tell you guys that I played the proper way. I played the way everybody should play. OK, uh, every kid should play the way I played. Go out there for two and a half hours, bust your butt, win the game. If you don't come back the next night and do the same thing, you owe that to your fans, you owe that to your city. You owe that to your teammates, and you owe that to yourself, okay? You look in the mirror after the game, and you say, I busted my ass, I give 110%. You can't do nothing else, okay? And the good thing about the game of baseball, you can be a GOAT on Monday, and you can be a hero on Tuesday, and I'll give you a story that verifies that. We're playing one night against Montreal. When I say we, I'm with the Phillies, okay? Mike Schmidt very seldom swung at a ball. He had a great eye. Him and Morgan had the best eyes I've ever seen. And this one particular night, we're playing Montreal, and Mike is 0 for 3 with nine pitches, three strikeouts. Okay? So all of a sudden, this is true. The, the score is 1 to 1. He's leading off the ninth. We're playing in Philly. Jeff Reardon's pitching. Okay? Throws the first pitch to Mike. Mike hits a home run. So here's a guy going around the bases right to the star of the game show. He saw 10 pitches, nine strikes, but he hit a home run to win the game. So it's not what, it's what, what you've done for me lately, not what, not what you did in the first or third or fifth, sixth inning, what you do the last time up in a tie game. That's how strange baseball is. You understand what I'm saying? Because you, you never know what's going to happen because you see something different every day, okay? You just see something different. It's, it's just amazing the things I've seen over my career. Hell, one day we're playing the Dodgers, a businessman special in Cincinnati. We scored 14 in the first inning. Another time in Chicago, when I went to Phillies, we're playing the Cubs. We won 23 to 22. I, re I remember that game. Yeah. Another time in 1963, I hit the first pitch off a of Jay Hook at the Polo Grounds. First pitch. Home run, we won the game one to nothing. That did not – the only the – one pitch in the game, one to nothing. That happened 50 years later in 2013. 63 to 2013. A guy in the – I forget who it was. A guy in the American League hit the first pitch. Think about how, how strange that is. One pitch, the rest of it's insignificant. The game's over, one pitch. Do you know, Speed, you're talking about, you know, the, the you were talking about you and Perez knowing each other since 60. So the longevity of your baseball career, you think of all the guys, you know, you, you were batting against guys like Warren Spahn and, you know, guys that people think are old timers. All right. And but then you went all the way up to 86, 87, where you're facing Oral Hershiser and Mike Scott and guys like that. So my question to you is, who, in your opinion, was the toughest? I couldn't hit Koufax. But nobody who, could. Who could? <laughs> nobody could. You're absolutely right. Koufax was, uh, uh, Koufax was like Nolan. Nolan Ryan. Every time they went out there, they could pitch a no-hitter. And they did a lot. Yeah. But Koufax, yeah. Just, Koufax had a, a great fastball and a great curveball. And that's all he had. He didn't have no change-ups or sliders or anything like that, but he was always around the plate. And uh, 
I hit 10 for 57 off of it. Don't get your calculator out. That's 175. That's, that's, that's what I hit off Kofax. But that's okay because uh, not many guys hit. Tommy Helms could hit Kofax. Woody Woodward could hit Kofax. But I could. Okay? But not too many guys could hit Kofax. Mary Shell, uh, you know, like I hit 340 off of him. You talk about Warren Spahn, okay? I got, I got 16 for 30. 16 for 31 off Warren Spahn. I hit over 500 off Warren Spahn. I got a five for five off of Warren Spahn. I got a five for five off of Gaylord Perry. I got a five for five off of Phil Negro. Those are all Hall of Famers. You know, I got five hits 10 times in the game. Okay. I got, I got five for five the second, the, the last game I started. I got five for five off the Giants. Then I pinched hit twice off of, off of uh, Goose Gossage and Lance McCullers. Who could bring it? They yeah, could bring I was, it. Yeah, you damn right it could. I, I was player manager, and I pinched hit twice and struck out both times and said, this ain't for me. You know, I'm 42 <laughs> years old, I can't pinch hit. And Tony Perez was chasing the Latino home run record, and I was a manager. So the last six weeks of the season, I just let Tony play every day because he, he was my good friend. And he was a good player. I mean, we were both 42 years old, but we're still – you know what drives me crazy, Jim? And You talk about how I knew the pitcher I was facing that day and what he threw and stuff like that. And I get a kick out. You, you'll bring a guy up to pinch hit today. In the World Series, I saw it a couple of times, okay? And this pitcher's out there on the mound. You saw it. And he takes his hat off, and he's looking how to pitch the guy. You're waiting to the sixth game of the World Series before you know how to pitch a guy that's coming off the bench. Didn't you have a pre-meeting? Didn't you have a, a, a meeting about what the guy hits and what the guy can hit? They're always looking in their hat. They're always looking in their hat. I don't, I don't get that. I didn't walk up to wait, take my helmet off and say, okay, this guy throws a fastball, a slider, and a, and a curveball. I already knew what he threw. But what do you say today about the fact that just everybody running out of the bullpen is throwing 99 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, and that's just what the, the game has, has become? Like, let, me tell you, let me tell you something about that, okay? Not everybody. Not, a lot of them are, but not everybody. And just like if I ask a guy, what's he throw? Okay, a guy say, well, he throws fastball and a curveball. A scout or an advanced scout would say. Okay, when he says he throws a fastball, does he throw a straight fastball, a sailing fastball, a sinking fastball? Because let me tell you something. No one will ever throw so hard you can't hit it. Okay? No one ran through 100. Okay? Constantly. J.R. Richard threw 100. Okay? Uh, no, uh, Ryan Durham, Yankees and Phillies, threw 100. So don't act like I didn't face guys who threw 96, 97, 98. Okay? I would rather face those guys than Greg Maddox, okay? Because he's going he's gonna to operate on you. He's going to just chew you apart at the plate. It's guys that can pitch. It's the guys I don't want to face, not guys that can throw, because everybody can throw. You understand what I'm saying? And I know they throw. They're bigger today. They throw harder, but not overall. I mean, I can, face, I, I can tell you Hall of Fame pitchers I face. I face 17 of them. Did any of those relievers today throw as hard as Goose Gossage or Lance McCullers? They're, they're in the upper 90s, aren't they, Jim? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I don't want to hear, well, they, they throw so much harder today than they did then. Well, I don't care how hard they threw. I well, got I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying that they that it's it's the right thing. I'm just th the, the baseball strategy in my mind today has just become – run guys out there that throw a hundred. That's the pitching strategy. And then the hitting strategy is use launch angle and try to hit it out of the ballpark. It's power versus power. And I, I would argue kind of like you were just saying is that that's not always the best thing because you said, you just said it, if you're in the big leagues and you can hit, you can hit a hundred miles yeah. an hour. You're going to get your time and down. I just, I, I don't, I, I guess it's in some ways it's intimidating to have three guys in a row come out throwing a hundred at you. Um, 
But the pitching strategy is almost like, like you said, throw it a hundred and maybe you don't know exactly where it's going. And so maybe that's a good strategy because you, you have the offensive player in this situation. Okay. Let's say you're one of those guys that go up there and swing for a home run every pitch. Okay. I don't give a damn how many times you go up there and swing for a home run. If you hit 40, you've done a good job. But what have you done with your other 450 at bats? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, mean, I agree with you. I mean, believe me, believe me when I tell you guys, okay, base hits with a man on second win games too. Base hits with two outs with a man on third win games too, not just home runs. Home runs are a way to guys to get the salaries up. Okay, all the guys making all the money today are home run hitters. Okay, They aren't the guys that's winning all the games. Like I told you, and I, like I said earlier, to me, when, as a former high school college pitcher, nothing was worse for me than the leadoff guy getting on first base. God darn, man, that, 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 that made the whole inning tense. Yeah. First of all, I brought you in a stretch. Yeah. And by the way, if, if we could go out there, uh, I'm in Vegas, you're in San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. If we could go out in that parking lot today, I take my chances hitting off of you today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, 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 and a million other guys, I can guarantee you. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. But you know, you know what's amazing though, if you listen to the games, and Callan and I kind of argue about this all the time. I, well, I listen to the Giants games, and I listen to John Miller. Okay, and every good, every single batter every pitch he they'll or he and Kruko and Kuiper they all do the same thing here's the pitch oh that one's in at 97 or that one's in at 95 quit telling me how hard the ball's coming you know I don't care how hard he's throwing it I, I want to see if he gets him out who cares Kruko I played with Kruko in Philadelphia Kruko's a great guy you, you know him right oh yeah he's, sure. uh, he's playing in Philadelphia one time and he had a game a bad game or something and and uh, he told the press, he said, you know, if the Phillies had any sense in the world, they, they'd trade me. The next day, they traded him. <laughs> he told them to trade him. And then, <laughs> Kruk was, he was an aggressive pitcher. I love Kruk. Kruk was funny, man. John Miller was Joe Morgan's partner yeah. all those years on Sunday Night Baseball. Oh, they were a good team. They were yeah. a good team. No. But, uh, guys get caught up in miles per hour. Okay. Oh, yeah. Is there any difference, Jimmy? Uh, 98, 97, 96. Is there any difference? No. No. There is. There well, is. I'll, I'll tell you the difference is you take a guy like Mike or um, like Maddox, Greg Maddox, and I don't, did he ever break 90? But the fact is, how much did that ball move? I, I, I actually think he cheated. I mean, <laughs> in the, in the Hall of Famer, he's a great pitcher. But it's not normal, Jim, to have a fastball that moves that much. He start the fastball on the inside corner, and it go on the outside corner. I don't know how in the hell he did that. Yeah, I, he must have turned that sucker over, man. I'll tell you, Pete. Whatever he was doing, but but there's so many good pitchers uh, today. I mean, there's some guys that don't throw. Yeah, you know, there again, I don't care if a guy throws 97. Is it sailing? Is it sinking? Is it straight? If it's straight, you don't care. Hey. Aroldis Chapman gives up home runs, and he throws 101, okay? So that, that proves my point. Big league hitters don't care how hard you throw. They don't care how hard you throw. I swear the toughest pitch to hit, in my mind, is, well, a slider, a good slider, but a sinking fastball. It is. God, it is. How, how are those things? How about when you played a candlestick park, some of those sinking fastballs on the hands? The grass is a stick. I got a question for you about Candlestick Park. You know why they took the AstroTurf out of there? To put the grass in so to slow the ball down. No, no. They took the AstroTurf out of Candlestick Park. Okay? Remember this. Because O.J. Simpson told him if they don't take the AstroTurf out, he's not coming to the 49ers. And they put the grass in. Did not know that. That's the truth. Hmm. You learn something new every day. <laughs> what 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 was your what was your favorite stadium to play in? Any place that had AstroTurf. <laughs> I, I I just let, let me tell you something, Jim. 
We moved into Riverfront Stadium June in 1970, okay, from Crosby Field, where Riverfront was AstroTurf. We played, which is true, we played the next 10 years without a rain out. We had a lot of rain in Cincinnati, but you had the Zamboni clear the field. We had a lot of rain delays, but no rain outs, okay? Because one thing you hate as a baseball player or a manager is rain outs. Why? Because if you have rain outs, you get backed up with doubleheaders in September. And if you're in a pennant drive, which we always were, a doubleheader is almost like a loss. It's hard to sweep doubleheaders. If you have three or four rain outs, but you don't have on AstroTurf, on natural grass fields you do, now you don't have those four doubleheaders in September. If you're chasing the Dodgers or they're chasing us, we want single games. We want one day, a, one game a day. And AstroTurf didn't help you as a hitter. It helped you defensively because the ball's not going to take a bad hop. You think it was really fair what happened to Tony Kubek in the World Ooh, Series of Pittsburgh? In 60. When it, took, when it took a bad hop and hit his throat? Yeah. That's not fair because it's, it's something you can't practice. You can't practice a ball taking a nasty hop like that, and it costs him the World Series. Yeah, that's not fair. That's not fair to a player. It's not fair to a team. Were there were there stadiums you played in that the infields were, I for want of a better word, brutal? Yeah, Atlanta. I mean, I, I, Atlanta was the worst infield in the world, Jim. I wouldn't even go out during batting practice and take my ground balls. Hell, if I go, if I'm gonna go out there, I got to put catching gear on. <laughs> Okay, in Pittsburgh, Forbes Field. I mean, every time you slide, you get a strawberry. It was so hard. Really? And I remember, and I remember Clemente. Okay, I played second against Clemente in Pittsburgh. He used to hit balls harder at me as a right-hand hitter, the second baseman, than Stargell did. The way he hit that stance and the way he went in like this yeah. and throw that big bat at that ball, he could hit you some ropes at second base. And he was a right-hand hitter. Yeah. Roberto Clemente was a right hand hitter. Yeah. Oh, he had yeah. a great arm. You know, I used that's another thing I used to do, Jim. I used to I used to like to run off the guys with the great arms. Because first of all, they don't think you're gonna run. And secondly, the guys with the great arms always miss the cutoff man. There's a reason why you have a cutoff man. If I'm at Pittsburgh and I'm on first and the ball hit the right field, it was short right field because of the fence, the way the configuration of the stadium. I was going to third. And if Clemente threw me out, take your hat off to him. He made a great throw. But he missed a cutoff, man. And the, there's a reason why you have a cutoff, man. And there's a reason why you hit him. Because usually it keeps the, the double, double play in order. Okay? You missed a cutoff, man. Now you're second and third. Those are just little things that the average player don't understand. I don't know why guys don't go from first to third more than they do today. I mean, I used – when I got on first base, I was like at the dog race. It's come, getting ready to come out of the gate to go to third. Because that – you know, especially with one out. Not with two outs. I got to walk in there. I can't slide. Okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in score position for, for Morgan, Bench, and Perez. That, that, that's what my job was. You know, I had to figure early, Jim, the faster you get around and tag home plate, the team that wins is the team that tags home plate the most in that game. Not first, not second, not third, home plate. That's the object of the game. Stolen bases are a lost art in today's game. Yeah. Why? They're waiting around for a home run. You know, I didn't steal. I only stole 198 bases. But here's here, Because I would have hurt the team to steal bases, and I'll tell you why. Okay, let's say I lead off with a single. Okay, first pitch, I steal second. Now I'm on second, no outs. Now Joe Morgan's batting. Okay, all of a sudden Joe hits a one hopper to the first baseman who's not holding me on because I stole second. Now Joe's out at first. Okay, and I'm on third. Where if I don't steal second, Joe gets a base hit because the first baseman's holding me on. Big hole over there at first base. Now I go to third. The first pitch, Joe steals second. Now we're second, third, no outs. But we're not in that scenario if I steal second because Joe was a pull hitter. And if, if a pull hitter, you want the first baseman holding the guy on at first base. Big hole between first and second baseman. 
So sometimes you, you, you hurt the team by stealing bases. That's the scenario with Joe Morgan being a pool hitter. Yeah. You know, um, we were talking earlier, you know, so much about you is about your offense, the hit king, all of that. But people don't realize, many people, that you were a two-time gold glove winner too. And that, that had to be a lot of work. Yeah, that was, the, that was in the outfield. And, and I remember, Jim, <laughs> that was funny. I remember I won a co- couple gold gloves in the outfield. I was aggressive, as you know. And after I won the two gold gloves, the next year, I did not make an error in the outfield, and I led the league in assist, and I didn't win the gold glove. Go figure. But I think I won the gold gloves the year I won the batting title. Yeah. So you, if you're a good fielder, that usually comes with that kind of deal. <laughs> 69 and 70. Then I won the bat title in 73. Okay. This is an interesting story. 1968, my first batting title. I go to the ballpark on Saturday. We're playing the Giants. Matty Lou, who I'm about a point ahead, maybe half a point ahead. Okay. He's playing in Chicago against Fergie. I'm playing against Gaylord, Cincinnati. Okay. I go five for five on Saturday afternoon against Gaylord. Matty goes four for four in Chicago against uh, Fergie Jenkins. We went nine for nine. The next day I went one for three. He went 0 for four and I won my first batting title. Okay, now the next year, the only way I can lose the batting title, this is true, it's funny too. The only way I, don't tell Clemente's family though, okay? The only way I could lose the batting title is I'm 0 for four and Clemente's four for four. Okay, so here we are. We're playing in Atlanta. We got fifth place all locked up. He's playing in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I'm 0 for 3. He's 3 for 3. Okay? So <laughs> if I make it out, he gets a hit. He wins a bat title. So I come up to bat. I look down at third base. Cleet Boyer's down there. Okay? I look down at Cleet. Cleet goes like this. Hey, Wicks. I mean. <laughs> now I look at him. He's five feet behind third. I drop a butt down and got a base hit and won the bat title. <laughs> hey, you're you're only hearing it here, folks. I I never had a guy wink at me in my life. <laughs> he gave me one thing. <laughs> he was my buddy. He was my buddy. <laughs> uh, oh, those are the good old days, man. We had fun. If you had to say the funniest story you ever saw. I mean, you probably have to think about this for a day or so, but one that comes to mind, stuff like that. Give me another one. Okay, we're playing in Chicago. And <laughs> needless to say, it's old. I mean, it's, it's still Wrigley Field. Okay, it's old. And up in the clubhouse, you ever see one of these real big dryers? Yeah. Dryers in a clubhouse? Yeah. Okay, a real big one. And, and uh, Morgan and, and Bencher are sitting in the trainer's room. And Davey was in a slump. I mean, Davey Concepcion was in a slump. And he say, I saw we, okay. So he gets in this dryer. I mean, he's six foot two. He, yeah, he gets in this dryer screwing around, okay. And the on and off switch is over there. And Tony comes in and he hits the wall and the dryer goes, woo, woo. It goes around three times. I'm saying, oh, no. <laughs> Davey, it's going to kill him, okay? So he finally got it stopped. This is a true story. And Davey got out. It burned all the hair off his leg. Oh, no. burned all, all the hair off his arms. He went out He went out that day and got three for four. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You, you didn't put him like, back in it, did you? Oh, my God. He, he never – he wouldn't even let the, the, the clubhouse guy – he wouldn't even let him put his jock strap in the jar into that. <laughs> oh. I remember one time my son's playing baseball, Jim, and, and <laughs> he calls me one time. He says, Dad, can you help me? Okay. And I said, what's the matter, Petey? He says, well, I'm over 21. I said, what? He said, I'm over 21. I said, what the hell are you calling me for? Call Concepcion. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about going over 21. <laughs> I went over four a couple of times. Oh, jeez. <laughs> We is well, Jim. I don't know if they have as much fun as we did, but uh, we 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 have you know you, you know Pete. I wonder sometimes. I really do. I I know we sound like old timers. Cal is a young timer. You and I are the old timers here, but the game back then really was fun. I think major leaguers back in the 60s, 70s. I know when I got involved in pro baseball, working you know for the company, 
guys really had fun. They did. Yeah. I remember my first All-Star game, Minneapolis, 1965. Okay, we get to, uh, what the hell was the name of that stadium? Old Met, Old Met. The Old Met, wasn't it? Old Met. Yeah. And we get to the, the ballpark the day before. I'm a rookie. I'm a young kid, three years in big leagues. I already made an All-Star game. And uh, the guys got me locker in between Mays and Aaron. I'm going, what the hell am I doing here? Willie Mays is here and Hank Aaron's there. That's why I love those guys, Jim, because they treated me, they treated me like I was one of the guys. You know, we, when we played the All-Star game, Jim, we played for league pride. We didn't have all the guys changing teams today. The only game we lost, I played in 17. The only one we lost was 71 in Detroit when Reggie hit that Reggie ball. Reggie went deep, oh, yep. I mean, that thing would have went out of Yellowstone Park. So, oh, yeah. Oh, that, that, was, that, was, that was the one off Doc. Yeah, this, yeah, Doc Ellis, yeah. There was more Hall of Famers in that game. Unbelievable. And we used to – if you ever was in our clubhouse the day of the game and Mr. Warren Giles, Bill Giles' dad, owner of the Phillies, when he would walk in and, and his office was in Cincinnati. So he, was he, would, he was president of the National League, right? President of the National League. He would walk in and give us a, a speech about how important it veins in his neck would pop out. I want to win this game because I want to show the world that the National League is better than the American League. And if you don't bust your ass in this game, you won't make the team next year. And in those days, you wanted to make the team because it gave you something to ne negotiate your contract with. You got to remember, Jim, my first 16 years with the Reds, I had one-year contracts. Yeah. One-year contracts. I got paid in 75 what I did in 74, 78 for what I did in 77. And being an all-star was a good thing to negotiate your contract with. Okay. Sure. I'm the all-star team. I don't have to be worth 10,000. You know, I won rookie of the year. Okay. And the next year I made 12,500, $12,500. Okay. I made 7,000 my first year in the big leagues, 7,000. I got that much in my pocket. Hey, I got that much right here. <laughs> I mean, but, but that was it. But, but I'm not bitching about that. I'm just, I'm just showing you how times have changed. When I went to Philadelphia for the 79 season, Jim, I signed for 810000 a year. Okay? That's for 1979. That made me the highest paid player in team sports because at that time, there was a basketball player named David Thompson from the Denver Nuggets, North Carolina State. You remember him? Sure. He made 800000 He was the highest paid player in sports. But the 810, when I went to Philly for my first year, made me the highest paid player in team sports. That was 79. Now, today we're at 220, 2020. There's guys making $35 million. That's how much it's increased. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's it is interesting to see hey, God what's bless in the game. I don't I don't bitch or complain about guys that sign big contracts. Hey, I used to defend Alex all the time, Rodriguez. He signed two two fifties. Okay? And people like to badmouth a guy that signs a big contract. I used to tell people, let me tell you something. Instead of badmouthing Alex Rodriguez, the next time you have a contract, call his agent because he knows what the hell he's doing. That's you're only as good, Jimmy. You're only as good as you negotiate. No, that's good. You're right, Pete. I remember as a kid, I mean, look, I was, I'm a little younger than you, not much, but you were in the big leagues and I was in high school. And I remember I used to read Sport Magazine and Sports Illustrated. And I remember an article one time about you. And you were kind of a hero to me. You were, the, you were the real ball player to me. And you said you wanted to be the first singles hitter to make $100,000. I remember reading that going, wow, 100000 bucks! Can you imagine that? Jimmy, I remember one time uh, I got there. I got to 100000 And I was on the cover of Ebony. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they had all the guys. There was like Mays, Aaron, Frank, Frank, Frank Howard, Yes, me. They had all of us on the cover of Ebony because the story was about hundred thousand dollar ball players. Yeah, hundred thousand, and that was a big, big contract. Oh yeah, it was. It, it was a plateau hard to get to. Okay, and uh, 
I was on Sports Illustrated cover 19 times. 19? Yeah. Ooh. That's the most ever for a baseball player. Of course, uh, Mohammed's got over 30 something, and Michael's got a lot too. But I got the most for a baseball player. And I've been on Sport Magazine umpteen times, you know, because in those days, uh, and when I was on 19 times, Sports Illustrated came out once a month. Yeah. Now I believe that in the last many, many years, it came out once every week. Yeah. So it's easier to get on the cover now than it was back in the 70s or oh, 80s. I, I, I remember when you were chasing Cobb's record and Musial's record before that, you know, we at the company, we were just dying for Sports Illustrated to come out because we figured you were going to be on the cover, and you were. It was pretty cool. You know, I always had the, I always had the Mizuno East and stuff. I always had my batting glove on. I always had yeah. my shoes on. I always had my bat in my hand. Yeah. And it was all Easton or Mizuno. That's what I used. Yeah. That's what, starting in 79, that's what I used the rest of my career. I'll tell you the picture that we always were waiting for, and we got them, was the Boone Rose play in 1980 World Series. Yeah. You can you can describe that play. Describe what happened there. Well, first of all, uh, Boone still thinks that was my ball. But what <laughs> we don't understand about that situation, okay, there was one out. Bases are loaded. Not two men on. Bases are loaded. So I'm not holding a runner on at first. Now, this I'm, is the sixth game of the World Series. Yes. I'm 15 to 18 feet behind first base playing my normal position. And the, the pop-up went over by our dugout. Okay? So if I'm holding a runner on, I'm closer to that play than Bob is. But because I'm 15 feet behind, he's closer to it. And he went over to the top step. And it hit his glove, and I was there, and I just I, – I had my Mizuno first baseman, and I just caught it. And they got that they got that on camera. And then the next guy was Willie Wilson, and we struck him out for the 13th time in that World Series, and we won the World Series in six games. Don't know if you guys could see it, but there's, there's that picture right there. There it is. It is. What that proves, guys, is what I try to tell people. When you're playing baseball, every time the ball's hit – Everybody's got, everybody's got somewhere to go. Everybody's got to be moving. And whether you're backing up this player or doing this or doing that, just don't stand there like this and, and be a spectator. Be, follow the ball because that white rat will find you. As soon as you try to hide from that white rat, it will find you. That's why you, in, in the Little League, you put, you put your worst player in right field. You can't do that in the big leagues because a lot of guys hit the ball to right field. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, oh yeah. That white rat will find you when you when you least expect it. It will be there. That's why you got to do that. We've we've talked and heard so many great stories of the past. What is what is Pete Rose a day like today? Now I know you you you've got your hit king stuff. You're doing your autographs. How, how's all that going for you? Is there anything you want to you know bring us up to speed on? Hopefully, COVID is is kind of well. It's ruining us because uh, I live in Vegas. I'm looking at the Aria right now and the Vidara. I'm right across the street. I'm on the fifth floor of the condo. And uh, I sign autographs 15 days a month, five hours a day. Over, not in the casino, at the, uh, the Art of Music store over at the MGM. But right now, there's no customers, so I'm not working. So I just watch, to be honest with you, I watch Jerry Springer at 11 o'clock, Steve Wilkos at 12 o'clock, Jerry at 1 o'clock, and Mari at 2 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hell, if you're going to do that, let's get down to the parking lot and I will throw it to you. <laughs> <laughs> or just keep talking baseball. Thank God the football started again. And we got a little bit of basketball. We, we, we've we always had horse racing. So those are the things that I watch. Okay, I don't go to the casinos. Uh, I'll go out when I leave here. I'm meeting a guy that's bringing me over five jerseys uh, that I need to send to some people. But uh, uh, it's pretty boring, to be honest with you. I'm not flying anywhere. Uh, I got my mask everywhere I go. I got my mask, which you guys do too. And I just hope this thing can, uh, can come to a, to, to a close. We just gotta, we gotta get it turned around. We gotta get it. We, we gotta keep, uh, keep working hard and keep going after it. Well, and people that need the chance to come see you and, and talk to the hit King. Cause it's, let me tell you something about that. Okay? Here's another thing about that is it, it, Jim was talking about it. You know, an hour ago or so about how I am with people because I'm nice to people because to be honest with you, 
I don't think I ever gave anybody a reason to dislike me. You may dislike me because I'm cocky. You may dislike me the way I stood. You might dislike me the way I wear my shoes or something like that. But I go, everybody I meet, I look at them as a prospective customer. You have to understand, you got to give fans a reason to come to the ballpark. Okay? You can't, you know, that's why I hated San Francisco. Great town. Jim knows that's a great town. But it was a bad place to go play a baseball game. I wouldn't have went to the games there. You got people behind our dugout with parkers on. You got people behind their dugout with shirts off because the sun was there. Am I right, Jim? Yeah, but but you know what? But you know what, Pete? As bad as it was, we got a chance to come see you play. So it was worth it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I'm talking more as a player oh, because I know. the yeah. more people, the more people that go to the game, the more you're appreciated. Okay, and that, that's just the way it is as an athlete. You know, you. you that's why uh, you'd love to play in Boston because they sell out every game. St. Louis. They sell out every game. Yankees could come close to selling out every game. Philly sold, sold a lot when I played there. Cubs sell out every game. You know, why don't the Rangers? You know, why don't Seattle? Okay. L.A. sell out every game. Why don't the Angels? You know, Dodgers do because they put a good product on the field. you got to give, you got to give peace in their people a reason to go watch you play. Okay, and the and the best reason is if they're out there busting their ass, where the people know you're trying to win for them. Okay, and I used to love to go on the road. I always thought I had more hits on the road, and I did it at home. So I did the research on it, and believe it or not, I end up having ten more hits on the road than I did at home. And the reason, the reason, here's the reason why I thought I had a lot more hits on the road than at home, because we were winning team. What did that mean at home, Jim? We didn't hit in the ninth inning. We always hit in the ninth inning on the road. Right. And I always broke the bat in the ninth inning. But I only got 10 more hits on the road as opposed to playing at home. That's analytics, folks. <laughs> yeah. Damn usual. Okay. Got 1830 at home, 1830 on the road, 3630. That's an amazing stat. So you don't need a computer to tell you that. <laughs> Warren Spahn, I believe, won 372 games, got 372 hits. You know, people are wondering now about baseball. And, Jim, we're in the industry. We, we sell products. We, we want people playing baseball. We, we love the game. We don't have a problem loving the game and wanting it. But some of this, the stuff you were just saying, Pete, about – you know, owing it to the fans and thinking of them of a consumer. And it's like baseball – now, you know, the the people that run baseball, they want home runs. They think that's going to get fans excited. But what you just said, I want to go to the game and I want to see people giving it their all. And you were telling Jim and I a story about a trip you guys took to Japan. And um, you felt obligated to play hard. Your picture was on the tickets to the game. And you said, I got to go and I got to I got to play for the fans. You you wanted to play well for yourself, I'm sure, and, and, and succeed. But um I wish that sense of obligation um, well, Jim knows. There to were perform years, was years, there. Yeah, there were years and years after that trip, Jim would verify this, that I was the most popular player in Japan. Oh, by far. And it's, by and far. It's, it's, and it's not, it, it, Mizuno helped, but, but it was the way I played over there. I think we lost Pete here for a second. Pete, you there? I think the baseball guys are telling us Pete has given us enough of his time today. And, um, man, that was, that was an awesome hour plus. And an hour, I thought it was like two minutes because it just went so fast. And I just wish we could keep talking because, you know, the history of the game was a lot of it in the last hour. I mean, that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're going to wrap up this week's episode of Right Off the Bat. And, and I would like to say that Right Off the Bat is an original production of Easton. The show is produced by Connor McGlynn. Connor, thank you for your technical uh, and production help and advice. And, and a big special thank you to, to Pete Rose. Um, that really made my day, made my week. You know, ma makes a baseball fan's uh, 
month life even i mean that was just so awesome so um thankful for pete to come on um don't miss uh, our next podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts or subscri- subs- or subscribe sorry and we'll see you then so this is callan thomas and thank you callan thank you pete and uh, this is jim darby and we're signing off and again real quick one last shout out to pete rose because that was spectacular and like i said i get to look at that picture every day in my house and uh it's pretty special for me to have him on today Thank you.